It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Andy Anako joins Jason Snell to talk about the Steve Jobs biography. What is wrong with it after all? We'll also talk about uh, Apple's TV plans, new MacBook airs, and a lot more. It's all coming up next on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is MacBreak Weekly, episode 274, recorded November 22nd, 2011. Feel my buttons. MacBreak Weekly is brought to you by Ford, featuring available Sync with My Ford Touch. Sync with My Ford Touch gets you to your destination with integrated turn-by-turn -turn directions and directional arrows displayed on screen. Check it out in the new 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Hover.com. Hover is domain name registration and management that's simple. Upgrade to a premium domain and trade in your old clunkers at MacBreak.Hover.com. And by Audible.com. To download the free audiobook of your choice, go to Audible.com slash MacBreak. It's time for MacBreak Weekly. Get ready. Fasten your seatbelts. All Apple, all the time on MacBreak Weekly. And today we've got a, boy, a really great bunch of people. I have to say that uh, Alex Lindsay is uh, in Chicago and uh, does not have sufficient internet connection to join us today. But don't worry, we've got the great Jason Snell in house with us. Jason, the editor in chief of MacWorld Magazine. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter at JSnell. And uh, always welcome commentators. Thank you for coming up. I guess you Glad don't live so far away. I didn't realize yeah, that. Yeah, just down the road. Yeah, well, that's nice. Uh, also, Andy Nako is here via Skype and his with his uh, stacked cauldrons. You're putting together... A, oh. <laughs> They're crucibles, sir, crucibles. Ah, I get it. In honor, in, in honor of uh, National uh, Novel Writing Month, Are I you? decided to, oh, to do tribute to an Arthur Miller play. Wow. Just because... A zig, the world zags. <laughs> so, uh, Andy Zaganotko, <laughs> thank you for being here, uh, joining us today. Just a word of warning, it didn't happen uh, during iPad today, which we recorded earlier, but as you probably saw over Jason's shoulder, the ditch witch is out front, oh, yes. and uh, they may be digging at any moment, so if you hear sudden <laughs> jackhammering, it is not me pounding my head against the table, it is in fact a jackhammer. Uh, they're putting in fiber, actually, for us. Yeah, there's a huge trench out there and a yeah. big machine with, like, giant sucking sounds. Yeah, it's exciting. It's not, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> Coming we from had, outside the studio for a change. We had no fiber into the studio. We had copper, but we have a lot of bandwidth through the copper because this phone company is just two blocks away, so we were getting 35 megabits from our provider, SonicNet, and they're really great. They do a great job. Uh, but, but that's kind of the max copper can carry uh, in this environment. Uh, so uh, we are we are ordering um, 100 megabit fiber symmetric. So we'll have 135 megabits in here, which we don't. You know, it's funny. People say, "Oh, well, that's because you're streaming," but we don't stream directly from here. We send a single stream to our partners, Justin TV, Bit Gravity, UStream, uh, and uh, and of course to Cashfly and AOL, so that they can then rebroadcast. We couldn't feed all the thousands of people watching. Well, it's usually around 5,000 people watch Mac Break Weekly. That would be just out of control. So. <laughs> uh, this is just, we need that much just to upload the files, believe it or not. So uh, I wanted to start off with something I, that may not be in the uh, uh, show uh, rundown uh, Ooh, today. Impromptu. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off uh, the script a little bit because I've been noticing, I, I noticed Dave Weiner's post yesterday, John Gruber's before that, and of course John Syracuse, I think who started all this with a podcast review of Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs. All three agree it's terrible, which surprised me because I really thought it was pretty good. <laughs> um, first of all, I'm not clear what their complaint is. Uh, Dave doesn't say exactly. He just says it's, it's fairy tale time. It's not the, what really happened. And the fault lies with, uh, with uh, he says, with the author, Walter Isaacson, because he wasn't technical enough to hit the technical high notes. He, right. was, he basically he says why Jobs chose Isaacson. He chose him because he was afraid a smart tech reporter would call him on his BS. See, now, Gruber oh. suggested that, too, and, and I think John Syracuse on his latest uh, podcast said that he, he's not sure he believes that conspiracy theory. I don't either. There's actually some stuff in the book that explains why Isaacson feels that Jobs chose him. 
um, if, if you look carefully, what you'll see is that Steve Jobs was really comfortable around people about his age, which is not right. unsurprising. People who lived through the 60s and the early 70s and sort of were formed by those experiences. And I think he picked Isaacson because Isaacson was one of the few people who were writers who had, in this case, written biographies before. Of Einstein, he, he was of Ben Franklin. Yeah. Right, he was, right. I, to me, and he was about the same age and they had had some dealings and he felt like that was a guy. He wasn't going to go out to somebody he hadn't met or somebody right. who was 20 years younger because he felt like that, that person, I really believe that this was not a calculation that I'm going to pick somebody who doesn't understand the technology. <laughs> no, I think, I think Isaacson, in fact, with him. on the surface of it, was a great choice. He was head of the Aspen Institute, former Time editor. I mean, this guy had the chops. He'd written some very successful, highly regarded biographies of great men. Uh, I, I mean, it, it, this isn't going to... Uh, and, 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 and Jobs, apparently, and I believe this gave him free reign, sure. didn't ask for approval, didn't even read the book sure. before he passed away. Yeah, it, it, was, it wasn't necessarily a flattering biography no. by any means. So what did he miss? Do you agree, Andy, that this is a, not a good biography? Uh, I think it's a good biography, uh, given that it was published... While the you know in in the last year of this man's life, I think that great biographies it takes two, five, ten, twenty years to really sh not only see that life in context, but also for people who are telling these stories to have additional perspective uh, on that on that time and on the dealings that they had with them. Uh, I agree that there were a number of times when um, I'm reading a passage I'm, I'm reading a passage of an event in the book. And I happened to know somebody who was at that meeting or in that room, and they told me a very different version uh. of that. Uh, but I don't think it was a. F I don't think it was flawed at all. Uh, I, I do agree. With, I do agree with the point that it's not the most technical understanding possible. I also agree that. Uh, Dave Weiner and a couple other commenters, uh, especially people who like talk, who cover uh, journalism beats uh, specifically, were concerned that there were passages in which Isaacson is saying, "I was told about these future plans that Apple was working on and this other device that they're working on, but I'm not going to tell you about it because I don't. I think that that's a trade secret, and Apple should have the right to develop this thing." Uh, Dave Weiner, in his piece. Uh, was a uh, uh, zeroed in on this as well, saying, "Well, look, that proves that he's sort of the lapdog of Apple. That if you're a journalist, you simply write about the entire story." I think it was, I think that that would have uh, talking about the stuff that he was told about Apple's future plans, about uh, pers things that are, are in the pipeline that Apple wants to sort of uh, pursue, would have added a little bit of extra color. I respect the choice that he made. I too sometimes learn things that. Are not are interesting, but not necessarily part of the story that I want to tell or that I think are is important. Uh, but I think it would have been interesting to have that extra those extra shades of color. Weiner yeah. says uh, it's it's like writing a romance without ever having experienced love. That, that, <laughs> wow. that Isaacson couldn't understand how it worked because of his lack of technology, but also couldn't understand the relationships that Jobs had. Um, and uh, he also says, I don't support the author's belief that Jobs' life was strictly a net plus for the human race. And I think this is really what maybe we're really hearing yeah. uh, is that it was <laughs> hard to believe, too kind. Look, everybody wants <laughs> some, to get something different out of this Steve I th Jobs I book. And, right. I, and I think the reality is there will be many Steve Jobs books. I think there's going to be a definitive um, biography of the man in the future, and this will be a great source for that. I don't think this is that book. I think one of the conflicts I see in people, but I also see in the book, is is this a biography of the man or of, of Apple? And it, it, it's torn, especially in the last 10 years, where he's got access that isn't in very many other books. You start to see the book veer off onto talking about, you know, here's the decision-making process at Apple about this thing, which is interesting, but I feel like there's probably a whole book about the second reign of jobs at Apple and the decisions they made that's not the same book as yes. jobs the man so i think we're kind of conflating a lot of different desires into this one book and no book was mm. going to succeed but what's great about this book is because of the access there are tidbits there are insights and um he doesn't sum it up and he doesn't say well let me explain to you everything about who he was but i got i formed some opinions well, and, I did I, too. And, and i feel yeah. like in five or ten or fifteen years somebody else will cite isaacson's book and will cite stephen levy's books and right. a bunch of other books and we'll get a much bigger overall picture. I hope he releases, uh, uh, it would be nice if he would release the interviews. He has tapes of all the interviews. That We've would heard be great. some of it. Just, just as transcripts, even for, right. for historians. Just, just for yeah. base materials, then for a, an, another book that uh, somebody might be 
do it from a different angle or a different slant. I, I really liked reading the book. I think for people like us who covered these stories, learning the behind the scenes of Antenna Gate, for instance, then Jobs at first denying it, then rushing back from Hawaii on v his vacation, bringing his son Reed to be in the meetings all day so that Reed would get a sense of how a business is run. All of these things were great tidbits. Maybe you're right. They don't sum up the man or sum up the story. But boy, there's some great material in yeah. there. Yeah. Well, also, also, it's valuable if only for this. This is the longest first-person account that Steve has ever given about him, himself and the company right. and the company, other companies he's run. So, and as any first-person narrative runs, a little bit's going to be self-serving, a little bit's going to be self-deceptive, but at least it's there. And so we now can, even if we discover that, well, he wasn't quite so open and honest about the reality of the, the creation around the iPod or decisions that made it to the screen of this device, the fact that we will now know that 10 years from now that actually know this is exactly how it went and he was either uninformed about that or he decided to ignore stuff that he was actually told, even that will give us more information about himself and the history. So... There, 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 there's, there's, I don't think there's any way to define this book as anything but an important book. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do think, though, that um, if people are interested in this subject, they should listen to John Syracuse's um, I'm going hypercritical. To. Yeah. Yeah. Number 42, I think, is the one where, and now, now number 43, they're good. He's, John, I do a podcast with John, too. He's, he's brilliant. He's a smart guy. Yeah. His points are strong. He's coming from a very specific perspective of what kind of book he wanted to see, and I think you need to take that. But it is, I mean, it is also kind of an epic rant about why he dislikes the book, <laughs> and it is delightful to listen to an epic rant. And the show is, after all, called Hypercritical. It, yes, you know, so. it does what it says on the table. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's fair enough. Yeah, it's at 5x5, five five and uh, uh, it's, yeah, I'm going to listen to it because I'm very, in fact, thanks to Dave Weiner for uh, recommending it, I'm going to listen to it. Uh, but, you know, people like Dave, not so much John, but people like Dave uh, have very much of an axe to grind. They have sure. a point of view. And so yeah. he, if it doesn't match his point of view, he's not going to like the book, frankly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Dave, he's he's interesting. The, the the great thing about a personality like Dave is that you will never have any question about how he feels on a subject. The only difficulty is that, and I've I've worked with him on like feature articles that I've written about some of his products and and uh, some of other people's products. It just seems like there is there is never any yes, but or I assume that this is true, and based on that assuming, right. no, it's right. either A or B. It's black and white. So, he, well, Dave himself says, I'm probably a little bit like Steve myself. Our stories kind of are parallel. Uh, and that's an interesting admission even in itself. <laughs> so. if, if, if you read earlier into Dave's blog, he, made, he once made like an Ikea bookcase, but he replaced the back panel with solid platinum. <laughs> because it's important that the back look just as good as the front. <laughs> you see? You see? So, he, so there, there is a certain synchronicity of thought. <laughs> you see? Yeah, I'm kind of like Abraham Lincoln. I'm just saying. Yeah. No. Why not? <laughs> no. I I, uh, I knew Lincoln. I worked with Lincoln, and you are no Lincoln. No. Uh, I I think I think we'll all agree. It's a it's it's an important book. If you're interested in the subject, and if you're listening to Mac Break Weekly, you probably are. It's it's certainly a, a must read. Right. And then I think I hope you're right, Jason. There'll be many many books to come. Maybe there's going to be a book about the technical history yes, of Apple exactly. in the in the Jobs era and the decisions they made. Right. Probably after some of those people have left Apple and can talk can about talk. It more freely. That's right. And that's going to be a great book. This isn't it. This is. Some anecdotes from that period, but yep. it's that, it's not it. Uh, one thing uh, we're learning, and I'm going to talk about it in just a second, that uh, apparently uh, Steve wanted uh, its own, the iPhone have its own carrier, its own network. Christina Bonington writing uh, on Wired.com. We'll talk about that in uh, just a moment. Um, but first, I would like to mention our friends at Ford, the Ford Motor Company, uh, makers of fantastic products. Uh, the best cars out there right now. And you can find out more about the technology involved by going to Ford.com slash technology. Um, you know, I talk a lot about Ford Sync because I, I'm a, I'm a, I have a, a beloved, beloved Mustang with Ford Sync. And, of course, the new My Ford Touch. And I probably don't mention uh, the kind of the key feature of it enough. I talk all about how it's like Siri for a car. You can tell it what temperature, what song to play. It ties in with Pandora. But, you know, it's also a really good GPS. <laughs> I probably should mention that. Uh, again, the whole idea of Sync is that you could do everything in the car without taking your hands off the wheel or your eyes off the road. That's really important for safety. They don't want you looking down at the screen and checking stuff. They want you 
for instance, for navigation, to press a button on the steering wheel, say this is where I want to go. You can give it a street address. You can give it a point of interest. They have really enhanced it now with 40 million businesses. So it's got a complete database of pretty much any business you'd want to go to. And that includes telephone number and directions. So you can say a point of interest. You could say, I, you know, I want to go to the Dunkin' Donuts, nearest Dunkin' Donuts. And it will not only give you directions just like that, but you can call them. Call ahead and make sure they've got that extra Krispy Kreme that you want. Oh, did I say Krispy Kreme? They probably don't call it that. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and it'll be waiting for you. So it's, uh, it, it, they have, um, now, I, I, this is what I was a little confused about because it says uh, that they have arrows on the screen. And I thought, well, of course they have arrows on the screen. What kind of GPS? But this is cool. With my Ford Touch, you've got a big screen here with the GPS, but you also have two little screens behind the steering wheel. And this is the beauty of it. You don't have to look down. The arrows come on the screen there and tell you which way to turn. So you really are keeping your attention on the road. I think that's, it's little things like that that make a huge uh, difference. Uh, and this is where Ford's really putting some thought. They also have an app. They have an iPhone and an Android app. So you can, for instance, uh, you can be on your computer and send directions to your account, your, your My Ford Sync account. They call it Sync Traffic Directions and Information Systems. You send it to the account, then it sends it to the car. You can call it up from the car. So it's a great way of kind of feeding the car your destination before you leave. Um, you, they also will um, uh, have things like they'll send you traffic updates to your phone if you have the app on your phone. Um, it's just it, it, the idea here is to integrate your personal technology with a car. So the car really becomes an extension uh, of your personal technology. And I think this is just brilliant and something no one had ever done before. Traditionally, the information systems in cars were awful. Not the Ford Sync and my Ford Touch. you got to try it. The best way to do it would be go to a Ford dealer near you. Say, I want to try the 2012 Ford Focus. It's got all the great state-of-the-art stuff. Or go to this website, Ford.com slash technology and read about their, you know, the EcoBoost engine, the plug-in hybrids. I'm going to get an all-electric. I just think that's cool. Uh, just really kind of a, a great thing to have. My key, the Bliss system with cross-traffic alert, the auto park system. It just goes on and on. This is such a great car company and a great technology company. And I think that's why they, they're they on Mac Break Weekly. They want to let you know they are a technology company. Ford.com slash technology. Give them a try today. When Steve Jobs first dreamed up the iPhone with his team at Apple, he didn't want it to run on AT&T's network, according to Christina Bonington. He wanted to create his own network. Actually, this comes from venture capitalist John Stanton, who uh, spent a lot of time with Jobs during this period. Stanton says Steve wanted to use Wi-Fi for his phone. <laughs> Uh, this is at a Law Seminar International event in Seattle. He and I spent a lot of time talking about whether synthetically you could create a carrier using Wi-Fi spectrum. That was part of his vision. You know, he might have been a little early on that, but I think actually that's going to be doable as we get more and more people putting Wi-Fi in the sky. Yeah, things. I mean, it's clear that Steve Jobs' default position on anything was, Let's why, do do, it. why do we have to do it the way it's right. always been done? Right. Isn't there some no. other and, way to and do it? And why don't or, we do it? Why do yeah. we have to partner with or, anybody, right? Exactly. That, that, that's, that's it. Why do, why do we have to be beholden to a carrier? Why can't we control absolutely everything? And, I mean, AT&T and Verizon have enough problems getting coverage in, in, in Vermont as it is. I can't imagine if they have a brand new standard that requires brand new uh, sub-licensing uh, spectrum and sub-licensing property to erect these, what I would assume would be a new series of towers to support this new network. Ooh, I'm glad that someone talked him out of that one. Well, it's interesting because this guy Stanton, uh, a venture capitalist, but he was employee number one at Macaw Cellular, which was, the, I think, the first cellular company in the U.S., one of the very earlier ones. It became AT&T Wireless. They acquired Macaw. Um, so he knows whereof he speaks. Um, and probably, maybe he was the guy who talked him out of it, but I, 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 I would love to see, and we now people, you hear people talking about Google doing that or Apple coming back and doing that. Um, it, it certainly is a business that's ripe for reinvention, I would say. Right, and that seems to be that what Jobs and Apple have always been about is, you right. know, can't, is there something out there that everybody hates but seems to be the only way you can do it, and then can we do it right. better? And in this case, it, yeah, it doesn't seem like it, it yeah. was practical it doesn't, then. Look, I mean, look, look what they did with iMessage. It was so much easier for them to say, we can reinvent text messaging by just using our network connection just as a source of Internet and then putting everything on that Internet connection. But the idea of let's... 
Let's talk to every church tower, every tur every owner of every church steeple, every water tower, every disused uh, um, smokestack from every abandoned factory, and get this get some sort of coverage <laughs> working. That's not a conversation that Apple would want to have with these people. By the way, I apologize, Jason. This was an IDG story appearing in MacWorld uh -huh. first, and I gave credit to Wired. Uh, which reprinted. Okay, the, we love Wired. We love Ars Technica. But but Nancy Goring got the story from the IDG News, yeah, news Service yeah. initially, and uh, so let's give Nancy uh, credit for that. Uh, but it, it was at a public event uh, on Monday that he was uh, speaking. Um, I, uh, you know, to me, I think this is a very interesting idea, and I just maybe regulate the chat room saying, "Oh, regulators would never allow it." Well, that's kind of the purpose of Wi-Fi; it's unregulated spectrum. You don't right. need regulators, right? Well, and maybe they would have had some sort of strategy where they were piggybacking off of cell networks when they didn't have the Wi-Fi signal or something like that, and something that was totally outside the box. And maybe they talked to the cell providers and they said, Ha, ha you're crazy, you're, you're nuts," and <laughs> and it all, you know, just didn't happen. But I, I love that. I mean. One of the other stories on on our little rundown here is about jobs in the Apple television and and you know the war on buttons, how Apple hates remote controls <laughs> with lots of buttons or devices with lots of buttons, and it's that same attitude of like I know that every remote control has a lot of buttons. Why? And just right. asking why does it have to be that way? And maybe there's a good reason. And I've certainly been. They did that iPod. Um, what was it? The iPod Shuffle that had no buttons, and it was terrible. And they put the buttons back. <laughs> At but least they, they had the sense to put the buttons back. Yeah, right? yeah, it's true. But there, there is with Apple the sense that they're always trying to uh, right. just break break uh, the tradition and say, what, what if we did it differently? And right. sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. I think everybody agrees we would like to see Apple tackle TVs. They, in the same way they tackled cell phones, which were horrible before the iPhone. Um, you compare a uh, you know a, a Direct TV or a, uh, a, a Xfinity remote with the Apple remote. There's a massive difference. Uh, like right. <laughs> a number of buttons. Right, but I can get to my channel on my Direct TV remote very quickly, That's and true. on, on yeah. my Apple TV <laughs> remote, so, yeah, uh, that exactly. would be so easy. a bunch of clicks and yeah. a bunch of moving around with arrows. And well, that's where the iPhone and the iPad could be very useful. I mean, this really could be a very smart interface. Yeah, and the Direct TV app is this actually pretty good for the iPad. On that, yeah. Yes, yes, and no. There's there's some areas in which you really don't want to over innovate, uh, and one of the problems with operating a remote control with this instead of this is that. You know, there's bumps on this thing here, oh, yeah. and and if it's well designed, this thing is a regular point, remote, by the way. This is well, this, yeah, this is the remote for, for my, people who are listening, Andy. I'm just explaining that you're sorry. Yeah, this, holding, this, is, this is this is the remote for my uh, for for my video camera, <laughs> yeah. and just to make myself look more intense as I say this, sorry. it looks like yes, the, we will obey like Andy. Res, Rasputin, the mad that's, monk. That's here. why that's 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 why these concentric circles behind me they're, they're designed to start spinning whenever I feel as though people aren't really listening to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, you don't you use you you're, you tend to be looking at the at the TV screen while you are operating a remote, and with no with nothing but glass underneath your thumb your your thumb's going to walk around a little bit even if you're hitting the same button over and over again so that's why i think that one of the most innovative things that apple could do with the apple tv if they're not going to do voice command is just to give us a larger remote that is harder to lose that fits in your hand a little bit better if you're going to if you're going to be spending like at least a minute and a half on a certain operation like uh, tapping uh, uh, tapping in passwords for uh, different social network services uh, so sometimes it's not you don't want g whiz blue Bluetooth and quadruple multi-touch. What you want is just here is a conventional remote with conventional buttons that is fits really easily in your hand and it's not going to get lost. Don't yeah. you find it interesting that Nielsen uh, reports they did a survey that 70% of all iPad use, 70% of all iPad use occurs sitting in front of the TV. It doesn't surprise me. You're like, already doing that. There's a Comscore um, study that also says that al almost all tablet use, which is really all iPad use at this right. point, is either um, there's a big bump early in the morning and there's a huge bump late at night. So you're you're not just watching in front of the TV. In you're using too. it in bed when you yeah. when you get up in the morning and before you go to sleep. And that's yeah. But to Andy's point, I have a Logitech uh, Universal Remote and it's the one with buttons. And now they make a new snazzy one that's a touch screen, and I I won't buy it because. Yeah. I want to feel the buttons because I know where the buttons are, hmm, and that's interesting. A, whether there's something Apple could devise. It would be really cool if Apple. I could think you guys something. are old farts. It, it could be. <laughs> I think no. I think it's maybe. Possible. <laughs> it's possible. I'm an old fart too, but uh, and so. Well, I, you knew Abraham Lincoln, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just think that. Uh, by the, by the way, that was I think a Ronald Reagan line. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I knew Lincoln. No, wasn't that <laughs> you yeah. are, or was Woodrow yes. Wilson or somebody? Uh, <laughs> Um, I do think that the speculation that maybe Siri has a big 
part to play in this. It would eliminate the need for buttons if you could just talk to your TV or talk to a yep. device that talks to I your talk TV. to my TV now, but it doesn't yeah, listen. Yeah, it doesn't listen. <laughs> Stupid TV. <laughs> Um, no, don't that's, that's, don't don't see yeah. Don't send us toward that third act plot twist that we know is no, happening. Do something. No. Call the police. Call the police. Don't He's go in the room. Not a vampire. So uh, I I do it's, think it's that uh, the idea of saying play Gossip Girl or rewind thirty seconds or rewind five minutes eliminates the need for buttons yeah. or glass. Well, not, I don't think you could ever eliminate it. I think it's, it's a good adjunct because so much of what you're selecting is really search. I don't care what channel uh, American Chopper is on. I just want you to tune into whatever channel. I know it's on now somewhere. Just find me American Chopper and tune to that thing. Uh, or if it's on my DVR, play the last episode of House. Uh, but there are times when you are, if, if, if I'm you know, <laughs> splitting, my t splitting my attention between the iPad and the TV, skipping back 30 seconds to pick up a line of dialogue is not necessarily a Siri, please skip back 30 seconds sort of mental operation. It's more of a blip sort of operation, isn't it? I guess. So I, I, Aren't we, I, though, relearning a lot of things? You might have said that uh, a year ago, that setting a reminder or a calendar event was a couple of clicks of the mouse. I'm more and more using Siri. I know this, Andy, because I read your Siri yeah. review, uh, that you agree that this is the kind of thing that does kind of transform how you think about commands. Mm. You know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying any, any of that for sure. I'm just saying that it's hard for me to imagine the idea of doing this being simpler than activating any sort of a voice inter interface for many operations. Uh, the, and, the, and it also uh, applies to channel surfing because there are times when you don't necessarily right. have right. a specific target. You just want to go blip, 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 blip through your right. favorites. That's so true. I, I, just, I just think that it's, it's an interesting and very subtle problem. And I, would look, I, I think that the first thing that I would love to read long form after the release of an Apple TV uh, is I want to have a conversation with the lead engineer who is working on the remote because I bet he had a really cool intellectual and sociological adventure over the year and a half it took him to figure out exactly what this remote should be. There's uh, also uh, the point to be made that the television business itself isn't a very good business right now. Um, uh, HDTV manufacturers pretty much wrote the year 2011 off, partly because almost everybody has an HDTV that wants one. Uh, we know that because Friday we're going to see amazingly cheap <laughs> HDTVs right. as they try to clear the stock. Although that's Apple's game, isn't it? Well, right? exactly. So there <laughs> might be an opportunity uh, because the TV manufacturers, I think that's why they brought in 3D. How can we get people to buy a new HDTV? <laughs> they already got one and they're happy with it. Uh, and, we've and we've saturated the market. Everybody wants one, has one. So what do we do? 3D is not the solution, but maybe uh, a very easy to use, somehow internet connected Apple style device is the solution. I'm, yeah. I, I don't know. I, th I think the solution most it involves voice control, but I think it mostly involves licensing. I think it's basically about piles and piles of licensing agreements being signed by increasingly skeptical executives that's at the different problem. cable companies and networks. I think that's, that's where the, the real innovation is going to be. That, that's it was just as important at for iTunes that they simply find ways that we can get every single music company on board with the service, find a way to give them what they want, and yet protect what we think is important to make the service work. That was as important as, as the iPod. That was as important as developing iTunes. It was important as the e-commerce system that powers iTunes. It was just those agreements. And, and it gets more difficult to make those agreements as these people have wised up. I mean, one of the things I did learn from the Isaacs, Isaacson book was that Jobs was able to make these music company agreements with a carrot and a stick. Uh, the stick was, you're going to get, people are robbing you blind. Uh, BitTorrent's going to do it anyway, and you can make some money this way as the carrot. And finally, the reason the record company executives agreed to it, uh, according to the book, is... Well, it's just Apple. We can, you know, it's gonna. How big a how big a part of the market could they be? We don't have to worry about this iPod thing. It's never going anywhere. And instead, it takes over the entire music industry. And I think now, uh, ooh, they've been burned a little yeah. bit. They're a little less likely, a little more reluctant. There's a never again kind of attitude. Yeah. which is funny. Never again will we let some company solve our problem for right. us? Right, make money <laughs> for us. Shocking. Yeah. But, but, I, that's, I just, but that's death. For, that's death, isn't it? Though, because nobody is going to want to have eight different boxes to get eight different station, eight different uh, cable channels. Well, but channels. that's what we've got now, and it's terrible situation. Yeah. Uh, but but the problem is all the stake none of the stakeholders get along. Nobody wants to give any one company that much power ever again. So they're all just going to go like this. Comcast is going to fight. HBO is going to fight. Uh, you know the the guys who make the content are going to. Nobody's going to agree. We got a mess. 
And I don't see anybody, especially Apple, cutting through that Gordian knot. S somebody will do it eventually, but I think that... Um, because I think at the end of the day, it's inevitable that companies like Comcast are going to going to give up and realize that they're a, a company that's a pipe. Give just, up, Comcast. Well, on Verizon, give it's up. Too, right? It's like they all want to say, "Well, no, no, we're not just a, a pipe that transmits bytes to your yeah, house. We have we have content and stuff." But in the end, they don't. I um, I had this conversation you, with one of the most forward-thinking cable companies in the in the country, Cablevision, eight years ago. Uh, at, it was, I think it's Comdex, if not a CES, but I think it was at Comdex, that's how long ago it was, saying, guys, why don't you just give up and admit that you're a pipe? And, and, he, and they said, you know, our business model <laughs> will not allow that. We need the premium subscriptions. We cannot sell bits wholesale. We can't stay in business that way. Yeah. Well, that, that's one of the encouraging things about uh, these cable companies, uh, excuse me, these cable networks coming together because they would love to cut out Verizon. They would love to cut out Comcast if they could because not only could, would they have the ability to get access to get, get closer to dollar one for each subscriber, they really want to have that information that they can gleam from you're, subscribers. You're talking about the, you said the cable companies. You mean the content companies. Uh, that's, that's, that's why yeah, I, like I clarified the, the networks, the H, HBO, TNT, not even, uh, Discovery, whoever TCM. produces. Stuff. I think that's why Netflix just is buying is they're they're producing Modern Family, uh, yeah. because they. Arrested they development. No, Arrested I'm sorry, Arrested Development. development. Right. Modern Family already has a network. Right. Arrested and that Kevin Spacey uh, produced show. House of Cards. Out too, yeah. And uh, I think that that's an acknowledgement that Netflix is it has to be in the content business in the long run. Uh, didn't we always didn't we always say that content was king and that in the long run your best your best bet is on yeah. content not on a delivery because the delivery is going to change yeah well, one of the interesting things about conan o'brien's deal with tbs was that he not only wanted ownership of the show he got a he got a david letterman style deal where he owns his own show it's not owned by a part owned by, by tbs but also because they own all the digital rights to it uh. so that means that they can essentially build the conan o'brien app or the conan o'brien streaming as a separate product and monetize brilliant. it differently brilliant so, I That's, think we're going to see you. We're, we're at that, there's always that, those cool phases whenever there's a shift in media where the large companies are either unaware that their money stream is like diverting through this new channel. It's not going, it's not going through the same canal that it's always been through. It's, going, it's actually sort of being going off through this mountain instead where they ignore it and they will simply allow people, oh, of course you can have the digital. <laughs> the stupid negotiator, he wants the digital streaming rights to his TV show. <laughs> sure, was, of course. You know. Un un unbeknownst to them, they're actually giving away something valuable. And what happens, like, in five years' time, it becomes another part of, like, corporate ownership where they're going to simply say, not only are we not going to air your show unless we unless we have at least 58% ownership of it, we're also going to retain the uh, digital broadcast rights. I, and think they, I think that's already been in the, that's been in the contracts for almost anybody except somebody with the cloud of a Conan and Brian always. I mean... I remember the cable deals with the tech TV did. You know, they 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 get the rights to every. You know, the cable company gets the rights to everything. Even, they even said to us, and then in 1998. And by the way, you cannot stream this on the internet. They're not stupid. They knew that this was going to be a threat to them. And normal contracts say rights to every medium known now or ever in the future. Uh, that's the norm. Is that we get all rights, and you have to be a Conan O'Brien to say. Well, you know, give me the digital rights. I don't think anybody except well, if, you, if 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 you, if you were the next iteration of Conan O'Brien, you don't even care about TBS to begin with. Right. You're probably you're probably Hello. either welcome to Twitter. Take, take, taking Leo Laporte out to dinner, uh, or yeah. <laughs> you're taking Leo Laporte out to dinner and then saying, okay, so let's see what how can I how can I compete with Leo Laporte? He, he <laughs> seems to have unattractive doofuses like Andy and Otko on his shows. We'll have we'll have handsome people on there. I show excellent, excellent, excellent. It's one word, my friend. Cleavage. <laughs> I, I, I Not yours, cleavage. please. Oh. Thank you. <clears throat> a little, little hairier than people <laughs> like, but hey, again, there's a market for everything. No, but I, I really think that's where we're headed. Is that the, the 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 power really lies in the hands of the content creators ultimately? Somebody in the chat room said something very brilliant: that ABC, NBC, CBS really are in effect venture funds for content creators. Somebody's got to give you the million huh. dollars to produce, uh, you know, uh, Arrested Development. So you got to go to somebody hat in hand, but that that structure could change very rapidly. Well, that, the the problem is that the networks own their own studios, and a lot of the shows that are on the networks are from their studios, so they they're funding themselves. That's like the old record companies, right? The record yeah. companies said you want a deal, you need a record deal because it's a hundred thousand dollars to make a record because the studios are so expensive. But all of that is changing 
But look, we built this studio, right? right? All of that is changing. So and you just what need is to the advantage? Right? And you just need to crack in the business model where and you somebody have that has crack. enough enough leverage to say, you know what, we could walk away from you exactly. and just do the internet. Exactly. And that changes the terms. I, I like HBO, I don't obviously I don't know I'm not privy to what HBO's relationships are with all the cable and satellite companies. I get the sense that HBO is such a must have that those guys they and they and they've power. gotten so much money out of those. Right. I mean HBO is an expensive channel if you're a right. just a regular end user. It would not surprise me if they're the ones who say, you know what, we're gonna also offer a subscription that's all internet. And they try and to are Jason the HBO guys go and what do you have to do to have HBO Go? Well, right now you have to be a, a like a DirecTV or Com Comcast. You have to subscriber. sign on to but, your Comcast account. But wait, account. it would not shock me if if there's another shoe to drop at some point. And it'll at be interesting point. to see because is Comcast going to say if you do that we're going to stop carrying HBO? Do you realize right. what a competitive disadvantage that would put well, Comcast at? We are seeing those battles go on. Fox fighting with the DirecTV. You're yeah. seeing that go on right now in many markets with the cable companies, with the satellite companies, and the content creators. Ultimately, though, what does a network offer beside they offer cash they offer distribution they perhaps often f offer studios that's exactly what happened in the music industry you don't need studios suddenly the internet it does your yeah. distribution mm -hmm. you don't need the cash we're seeing that now you still need a lot of money to make a star wars you still need a lot of money to make a, a sopranos but that money can come from a lot of sources it doesn't have to come from the traditional sources it could come from a netflix or it perhaps could come from an app. You could perhaps bootstrap it. What if you wrote a Sopranos yeah. app, you did a cheap Sopranos, made some money on it, <laughs> better, 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 better. You could bootstrap up to a million dollar uh, an episode cheap of Sopranos. Sopranos. That's, that's on, a whole show about Spike Tony not Sopranos. wanting to pay the bill yeah. in the diner. Hey. I only ordered the soup. Yeah. The whole thing There's, takes place in the pig store cafe. It's all, yeah. and the then I shot a guy. not very good. <laughs> yeah. But there's, it's, it's, it's the, there's, a, there's an obstacle against that because right now you, uh, there's a difference between the way that these companies can promote the hell out of out of content and put it in front of as many eyeballs as possible. A failing show uh, that maybe limps along until a second season and then almost immediately goes goes on a hiatus has about ten times the viewership of I think the of most right uh, podcast shows that would be considered Absolutely. a great success. There's a marketing even in, value exactly. Even, yeah. even in the world of even in the world of comic books. Uh, if you have 15,000 regular readers, you can support yourself handsomely off of your readership of your self-publishing. That's 10,000 issues below the cutoff point from that Marvel usually considers it's time to cancel this book. Right. So let's talk. I, I, th I think, part, I think a lot, the, 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 the last thing I just want to say, though, is that uh, I think that the, the key to this revolution, in addition to the technology, is just going to be creators who now their their wildest dream is now to make a quarter million dollars a year. Right now, we still have actors and producers whose wildest dream is to make a uh, million or ten million dollars a year because actors are not moving to Hollywood saying I you know I got a sitcom and I'm making over four thousand dollars an episode <laughs> it's like no they, they want to be Charlie Sheen they want right. to be getting a million plus well get over it or get over your get over your bad self yeah. same thing for record artists you can't platinum artists I don't know if that's gonna happen much anymore Damn. but if a million people can make money and make a living I think that's better than if one person makes a bunch of money I agree my thoughts Macintosh. We haven't talked about Macintosh in a while. Boy, the MacBook Air is a huge success. According uh, to NPD, the Air is 28% of Apple's notebook shipments. That's a 20% increase over the first half of the year. Uh, this July refresh. I have the old, uh, the 2010 MacBook Air. Oh, I've got the, I got the new one right here. Big difference? Uh, well, it's a lot faster. Yeah, but noticeably... Yeah, it is. Okay. It is the Core i5. I felt like the old Air was so fast because of the SSD. Well, the, it, it is. This is this is faster. But even that, still. But even still, yeah. and with Thunderbolt, you know, there's not a lot of That's Thunderbolt exciting. stuff out there. But yeah. that means that the, the MacBook Air, which you know, the original MacBook Air, you had one USB port, and everything mm -hmm. had to go through it. And now with the Thunderbolt port, you hook this thing up to a Thunderbolt display or a Thunderbolt hard drive. You can get gigabit Ethernet. You can get um, like super fast storage on a MacBook Air, which is. Uh, yeah. Pretty crazy, and this is where all of Apple's laptops are going. I mean, this question about well, about how big is the MacBook Air will eventually be irrelevant because I think all of Apple's laptops are going to be like MacBook Airs. Eventually. So I have a 15-inch Pro here, heavy, and I have an Air, and I carry the Air almost everywhere. In fact, the Pro is in the studio now because I don't want to have to carry it around. I want to carry the Air around. We've heard the rumors uh, that perhaps next year there'll be an Air style 15 inch. Do you think that's? I think it's got to. I think it's inevitable. In fact, will all of the MacBook line go to the Air form? Well, Apple's 
Apple has traditionally kept a lot of the features in the 17 inch just as the that's that's your well it's a laptop but it's got all the features of a desktop <laughs> if, you're, if you're crazy enough to want one right go ahead. exactly <laughs> but um, but I do think there'll be a 15 whether they call it a 15 inch air or not right. you know and then it's a path from there to just saying this is the MacBook and, and a 17 inch air would look so much like a pizza that yeah. you really don't want it yeah it's I think they'll keep be something old. big yeah. high-end around just for people who want all of that you know, they want to load it. It's like the Mac Pro. It's just, it's right. it's loaded up. So when does that happen? January? I think it's a 15-inch next year. I, 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 think I think it's without the optical drive and all that. I think it's inevitable. Yeah. Maybe maybe in May. May. But I think, I think it's going to be a little bit more slow than other people think because you still got a problem where you just can't put a big storage drive inside an Air. Uh, without a co without adding eight or nine hundred dollars to the price, you just can't do it. And the people who are using a MacBook Pro as their primary machine, two hundred fifty six gigs, you can do it. But it, it your stuff will probably fit in about two twenty, two thirty. You will constantly be bumping your head against problems where I, I'm I'm away for a week. I've got this. 18 gigabytes worth of video files. Oh, nope, I can't put it on this drive. So I'm going to have to now travel with an external drive uh, f uh, to support this machine that uh, I spent a little bit more than it would have cost me if I'd bought like a normal MacBook. But I, I think Apple clearly made the statement. Not, it's not just that uh, they're going towards the MacBook Air. It's that they are defining the MacBook Air as the default mobile Mac now. Uh, the first thing that when they when the MacBook Air 11 inch came out, the first thing they did was say, guess what? The plastic MacBook that cost $999, we're not even offering that as an alternative anymore. We're, we're going to fulfill existing educational orders for it. But now if you want the, the minimum buy-in for mobile Mac is the 11 inch Air. And that is where the center of the Mac experience is. I think this, they said pretty much the same thing when they went with the, thir uh, when they introduced the 13 inch Air. So I uh, I'm not surprised that it's selling so well. I'm not surprised that it's such a big wedge of their sales. I'm not sure this, it's so much because people are na are naturally gravitating towards these ultrabook style, super slim, super light SSD based machines. I think it's because this is now the $999 Mac. This is now the cheapest thing you can get. And now there's the added benefit of it's actually very, very slick and very, very slim and very, very sexy. It's not just the, <laughs> it's not just the institutional grade Soviet style made. How can we, how can we, this is made out of combustion pressed cotton fibers now anymore. <laughs> Yeah, not, I mean, at 9.99. I mean, I think this is the one that people had, you know, sent their kids off to college with. Is that 9.99 11 inch Air? And I mean, I've got the 11 inch Air here, and I love it. I do think that um, unless you've got huge things of HD video and stuff like that, that this push toward um, cloud services and having things in Dropbox and having your iTunes library stored on uh, on a server using iTunes Match makes the need. I don't feel like I need the hard drive space that I needed, and that's the first time that's happened where my ne necessary hard drive space has decreased ever <laughs> um, because I feel like I, I've got stuff that I'm storing in all sorts of different locations. It's it's more of an edge case than it used to be. I can see it becoming less relevant yep. and uh, you know but you're right SSDs are expensive and they do need to catch up. I have a I, I think this, I think this is sort of a generational thing because mm. people who grew up with there there there's now a whole generation that their Cloud. first word processor uh, yeah, they're, 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 there's a whole generation where their first word processor wasn't Apple Writer, it was Google Docs. So they're not used to local yep. storage. They, they're used to uh, dealing with that. I can go even better than Jason. I've got a 64 gig iPad that I can live off of for several days without really caring about it too much. But the, the, the big problem is that these aren't my, this isn't my primary computer. It's not even, and it's certainly not my sole computer. I think that if you're in a cir circumstance where I've got $1,200, $1,300 to spend on a computer that's going to be my one and only machine ever, that's when it becomes, a, that's where the rubber meets, meets the road as far as the sacrifices you make uh, for going with a MacBook Air. But yeah, I, I do think that uh, two years from now, uh, the MacBook Pro is going to be like the Mac Pro right now, where people are going to start to wonder how many years this product has left. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a two-year deal. I, don't, I think people are saying, well, next year there won't be any more MacBooks with optical drives. Is That's that's wrong, but it's so clear yeah. that this is where Apple's going, and I think actually looking at these Ultrabooks that are coming out, it's where the industry is going. I think, I think people having these light laptops and not needing the optical drive and SSD, <laughs> I can't believe how fast my MacBook Air is, and believe me, as somebody who used yeah. the original Air, that is not a sentence <laughs> that I ever uttered. That that was one of the slowest computers that I've ever used. And, yeah, and it overheated yeah. and it shut down the cores, yeah. but this 
thing. It's got a core. This one's got the Core i7. It's got uh, an SSD. I used to edit podcasts on my iMac. I gave up. I just used the 11 inch Air because it's way faster because right. the yep. SSD is so fast. Right. It was. It was. So, it was so difficult. As as luck would have it, today was the day that I finally sent back Apple's loaner 11 inch Air because uh, I, I was using it for about a month and a half for the review. I used it again for another two or three weeks. Then I really had to sort of box it up and leave it in the office. I, I was holding on to it so I could test it next to Ultrabooks that were going to be coming out uh, about a month ago. And man, I've never come so close to convincing myself that I need a second portable Mac <laughs> in my entire life. It's very uh, cute. It's very it's, sweet. Yeah. Well, it's not, it's, not, it's not just cute. It really is a totally different experience. The idea that you can now bring a full desktop style Mac with you wherever you go, even if you don't, even if you're concerned about weight, even if you're concerned about whether you're going to actually use it or not, it really truly cut into my iPad usage because uh, I could just simply toss into yeah. the same little light bag to for three hours at the coffee shop. I wish the battery life were longer, but it really is a wonderfully attractive device. I, I felt like I discovered that with the original Air, and I, I will have to try uh, the new one. Is iCloud going to make that uh, more reasonable too? I mean, uh, you mentioned Google Docs. Are people using Pages uh, in iCloud or well, or or the not, iTunes not until, the cloud stuff, you know, that, that no, I was in an airport. You certainly don't have to put your music ago. on there yeah, anymore, do I, you? I, well, yeah. they won't fit, so there's that. Right. <laughs> but I was in an airport that had, you know, free Wi-Fi, and I was sitting there, and I wanted to listen to music, and I had, like, a few tracks on my iPhone, but I just plugged in. Your whole collection. Opened up to iTunes Match, started playing, did a Genius Mix on my, mm. you know, and it was all streamed. Does it? Does it okay, it's, but... Now, see, it's not supposed is, to be streamed, though, right? It's supposed to be downloaded well, and it, then it streamed. Well, it gets downloaded it, in cache, but no, it actually is pretty seamless. But you're right. I mean, Andy's about to say, which is right, if you don't have Wi-Fi, you still need things stored, right. and that's why I've got a little cache on my iPhone. But but I've everybody now less. is remember now when you have an iPhone or even an Android phone, you have hot spotting. You kind of do have Wi-Fi everywhere, unless you're in like a United no, Airlines, no, you're, you're you're Stockbridge, exactly. Massachusetts. You really, but you re, you really don't. I mean, I I had uh, I, I was in Wisconsin uh, last right. week and had a connecting flight, so I, I essentially spent uh, two days in three airports, uh, one form or another. And you get to that point where I'm sitting here and I'm looking at a public Wi-Fi that doesn't really work very well. And I can't really get it to work with this machine. I don't know why, but okay, there I am. Here's another alternative where I can spend $11 just to download those eight tracks that I really right. want. I'm not going to do that. Uh, so it's it's kind of a bummer that if we're going to rely on the cloud, we have to have so much more. We have to be so much more aware of the management of our devices, and that's going to take a large adjustment. The second problem is that iCloud is probably itself, I think, two years away from being the pro fulfilling the promise that was made when it was first introduced at the developer conference earlier this year, because it's. Uh, even though we've had it for a couple of months now, I still don't use it as for a daily production thing. I'm still using Dropbox because right. that's the damn thing that actually works. iCloud is still the thing where I have to remind myself, oh, I've got to go, go to Safari, open the web app, choose the file that I just saved locally and drag it into the web app. When you do that, it is, I will, I will, I will use that horrible Apple term, it is almost magical that it's wonderful when I, 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 I'm... But I'm, it I'm, doesn't I'm, just work. You have to go through right. some hoops. Right, but Dropbox but it, it's, is a great it's, example. You, and you, you see how, you see and, how and, well it And that's work. why I'm using, I mean, I'm not using iCloud to keep Boy, this my is telling. Using, if neither you I, nor Andy are using iCloud. Yeah, I mean, iTunes Match is working for me. iCloud, it's not, because it's all tied to the apps and you're not supposed to think of it, but until the apps work, I, I have a couple apps that use it. But Dropbox has has been the thing that has enabled me to use this Air right. a lot of the time, and then also have an iMac on my desk at work. Yeah. We need we need two things. Number one, we need it to be supported on the desktop level as seamlessly as Dropbox uh, integrates itself. Secondly, Apple needs to just take lots of developers out to dinner, you know, put, carry them around in a big Apple branded snuggly for developers and say, it'll be okay. We're going to take care of you. We know that iCloud is scary. We're not just going to simply toss you off the bridge and hope that you learn how to fly with this. We're actually going to give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to implement iCloud correctly, how not to destroy data. Uh, because is there, there's an API. There, there is the, yes. there is an API, but there is a shockingly little guidance from Apple on how to use this sort of stuff safely. Uh, right now, it's forging, in many ways, it's forging an even tighter developer community than before because only through groupthink can they figure out what the huge problems are and the big mistakes that have to be avoided are. I was shocked that, uh, I, I, I've, I've told this before, uh, when, uh, when iCloud was first actually released, that I was trying to get I was, after after looking through developer uh, bl uh, blogs and developer message boards uh, for months trying to get a bead on exactly how iCloud was meant to work on the app level, I thought, okay, I guess I'm just too dumb. I don't understand it. I'm going to start pinging 
developers of major apps that I've known for years who would, who would who even even if I can't use the information they tell me, I could at least be educated by them. Rich, Rich and Siegel, even them, though, for sure, right? Well, I mean, even I, 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 I didn't, didn't approach Rich on this, but uh, for, for other people, it was literally, well, here are, we have no idea how <laughs> iCloud is yeah. supposed to be implemented. We have no idea how it's supposed to respond to the user. One of them actually showed me, here are three different, we, we are planning plan A, plan B, plan C. If it's supposed to be like a Dropbox style seamless syncing service, here's the interface we're going to use. If it's meant to be a pack me a lunch for the for my three days in, in Aruba, here's the interface we're going to use. And if it's meant to be just simply a, a, a very simple click this button to sync your doc service, then we're going to use this interface right here. That's what scared the hell out of no, me that they no still are not on the same page. That I have no doubt that iCloud is going to is going to get better, but certainly in this first iteration, it looks to me like it was conceived of as a tool for for iWork. Uh, because one of the problems with iCloud as it currently is, is designed is the idea is you have an iPad app, an iPhone app, and a, uh, and, and a Mac app, and they all use the same repository in iCloud. And, and that's great if you use Keynote or one of these right. other apps that has all those but three versions. we had that all along. Right, but if you've got... That was, that was uh, iWork.com, right? Yeah, so, so, right, I mean, which wasn't that great. And this works better, but what happens if you use a text editor on the Mac and a different text editor on your iPad and a different text editor on your iPhone? My understanding is right now, it won't, they won't talk because each Dropbox, or I mean iCloud <laughs> box is tied to a specific <laughs> app signature. Sandboxed. So it works great for Apple's apps. Right. But if you're a developer who doesn't have apps on all three of these devices, you can't really even use it, which is just really disappointing because I want to be it able strikes. to say I'm using BB Edit here or Scrivener on my Mac, and then I'm using this text editor on my iPad, right. and it just doesn't help you. No, it just doesn't it work. It strikes me very much like Mobile Me, the same sort of disaster Mobile Me ended up being. And it makes me wonder, is, is it so difficult to implement cloud strategies? Is that the problem? I don't think this is a disaster. I think it's not. I think it's just not done, and they decided to release it, and it works. It works fine with Keynote, and it works fine yeah. with Pages. The problem is, it's going to take another. I think it's going to take another year before developers really can give yeah. them the feedback about how they're using it, so that it works. Maybe I should say two years, because Andy's been saying everything's going to take two and, years. And by the way, there two is <laughs> there is one way to fix, perhaps fix this issue on an air. Let's say is by putting 3G in the damn thing. Why don't we have 3G in our notebooks? I'm a little surprised that Apple doesn't offer. Uh, 3G is an option. Maybe they don't want to tie the, the Mac to the carriers because they hate them so much. But it just seems to well, me I mean, the there's plenty of tied. PCs with 3Gs. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't understand why they haven't done that. That helps you with your cloud strategy because now where there's far more areas we can use it. Just seems like that's something you should do. Let's take a break. We're going to come back with more. We are, what a great panel. Andy Anatko from the Chicago Sun Times. And do read his uh, reviews not only of the iPhone 4S, but the Siri review just came out. It's very good. Uh, and, of course, Jason Snell of Macworld Magazine, who reviews everything all the time. <laughs> all, the time. .com. all the time. Uh, we want to thank our friends at Hover.com. I I, Elliot Noss, the uh, CEO of Tukas, uh, which is the parent company of Hover.com, was out here showing us new stuff. These guys are great. I just love it. They're, they're, their message is domain name registration made simple. Just, you know, here's what we're going to give you domain name registration. We're just going to make it easy. We're not going to give you 100 clicks. We're not going to make you have to shoot elephants just to get the thing registered. We're just go to, here's the deal. Go to MacBreak.Hover.com right now and take a look. It is as easy as can be. Um, they have some very nice uh, features. For instance, uh, no hold policy for customer service calls. If you call during business hours, which is Monday to Friday, 9 to 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, once you get that live person, you will never be put on hold. They're going to solve your problem. They've really empowered. This is one thing uh, that these folks really specialize in is great customer service. They also have a new feature. So let's say um, I want to register fancypants.com because everybody should have fancy pants. And I do a search for fancypants.com. They now have premium domain names. So obviously, I know as I search for this, somebody's going to own fancypants.com. If not, I'm going to register it real quick. Yes, somebody does. But look, here's fancydates.com. You see that gold star? This is what we call a premium domain somebody owns, but they've told Hover we're willing to sell it, and they put the price right in here. This means very easily and anonymously, because by the way, when Twit calls and says we want a domain, it ain't 950 bucks. You know, as soon as you tell somebody you want a domain, suddenly the price goes up. There are domains in here, very good domains, that are marked for sale by owner, and they put that gold star there. That's called a premium domain. When you upgrade to a premium domain, 
You can trade in your clunker domains, which is kind of cool. If you has anybody here ever done this, registered a domain that they now use? Quite a few of them, right? Because you think, oh, this is a great idea, and I have dozens. Those are called clunker domains. If you have domains you've registered or renewed at Hover.com and you'd like to upgrade your domain, Hover will take your old domain name back and give you credit for everything you've spent with Hover on your clunker, including if you did it at Hover, the online registration fee and any renewal fees. That is awesome. So get rid of the, you know, now you can register domains without even worrying about it because you know if you're registering that domain and you don't, you know, it, it, you, you don't end up using it, you'll get all your money back from Hover.com. And, of course, if you're registering a domain name at Hover.com, and uh, if it's not a premium domain, you want 10% off, just use MacBreak as the offer code, and they'll give you 10% off. I always do that. Whenever I register a domain name, type in MacBreak, get 10% off. If you want to trade in a clunker, call the customer service number on the website, or you can email help at Hover.com. Look, Hover is the greatest. Do not register to no domain names anywhere else. Just do it at Hover. Uh, I, I, you know, somebody called me up and said, oh, I'm having a hard time moving my domain names over. They have a concierge domain name service. If you have hundreds of domain names and you want to move from another service, they'll take care of it for you. Just call the number and tell them you heard about it on MacBreak and they'll give you a deal. Hover. I love them. H-O-V-E-R. MacBreak.hover.com to find out more. MacBreak.hover.com. And just do, you know, do yourself a favor. That's it. But the domain name registrate, uh, management interface fantastic all of that stuff hover.com uh the iphone 4s is best for browsing on at&t best for calling on verizon yep how are we going to handle that one well i mean what <laughs> the four so the 4s uses um doesn't use the 4g it's the hspa verizon, plus but it's got hspa plus which is a faster 3g at&t sort of wants you to call it 4g but it's, it's not, not. But it's faster but 3G. But it's good. I like and, it. And this is when I tested the Verizon iPhone when it came out. It was This is totally what everybody found, which is AT&T is faster at 3G. It's better for data. Than Verizon. If you've yep. got 4G, it's a different story, but it's faster at 3G. Yep. And the calls are more reliable on Verizon. Yep. I mean, Andy, I don't know about you. I, you tried it in, in Boston. I tried it in San Francisco, and that's what I found. Yeah. I can no, barely I, I, get I, data in San Francisco, though, whenever I'm in San Francisco. It's, it's funny. Yeah, I can tell you uh, exactly where you can't get data in yeah, San Francisco, yeah, let me just, tell you. I've, I've sort of had some fun, like, when I travel, I often I often tweet, like, with the, uh, here's, the here, here's the here's the count on all the devices I'm carrying with me for this, like, two-day trip to Wisconsin. It's like, I've got four phones, I've got three tablets, I've got one notebook. And usually that's because while I'm in this other city, I want to see how... The, how the Verizon phone works, how the iPhone works, how the Sprint phone works uh, on, on local networks. And the biggest advantage that I find with Verizon is always just simple network availability. That uh, when uh, when the, the fastest 3G speeds always go to AT&T, let's leave 4G out of it. But in terms of being able to get that 3G signal, I... I'm shocked if I'm ever in a place where I can't, where Verizon can't deliver me 3G, whereas often I'll just have it in my pocket and I'll hear that, oh, AT&T, you're on edge now, aren't you? Oh, isn't that adorable? Yep. Isn't that adorable? Yep. Yeah, sweet. What do kids want for Christmas? <laughs> An iPad, stupid. <laughs> Nielsen surveys kids 6 to 12. The 44% of them said they wanted an iPad. For the holidays, 30% said an iPod Touch, 27% said an iPhone, Apple dominating in the top three, then computer, 25%, and a non-iPad tablet, 25 I think that's just a kid who <laughs> forgot to use the word iPad. Yeah. <laughs> Daddy, I want an Android tablet for Christmas. No, I don't think so. <laughs> Actually, though, the Kindle Fire, if, Kindle you're, Fire. if you're going to get an, if 200 bucks, I think there are going to be a lot of Kindle Fires under the tree. I think that's a good gift. No doubt. No doubt they're going to be. I know. Wrong. I know the yeah, Apple iPad true. users think it's too sluggish compared to the iPad. I think. Yeah. I. I I'm actually. Uh, I'm reviewing the uh, uh, the Nook tablet this week on, in the Sun Times, and I'm. I looked at the draft that I finished last night, and I'm saying I got to cut this part down. The part where I spend a thousand words, basically yelling at everybody who said, "Oh, it's sluggish. The page turns don't look like raised curved paper anymore." Who cares? Oh, I, I launched it happened. It took three seconds. And, oh, this is a piece of. Oh, what a hu humiliating embarrassment for. Oh, for God's sakes! You got you got a tablet that cost one hundred ninety nine dollars that streams a million different things. And you know what? If I 
had an extra 300 bucks, yes, I would buy an iPad. Maybe I don't have an extra 300 bucks, and maybe I don't have a pocket that can hold a thing that's... T uh, shit. Yeah. So am I wrong, Andy? Am I wrong in thinking that this is all about people's attitude toward... Um, w it's where they're coming from, right? If you're coming up from like a Kindle, an e in Kindle, you're going to have a totally different expectation than if you're coming down from an iPad. It's... Well, it's not only that, I, I I think that when I see not all the not all the like complaining reviews, but some, but, but a lot of them, uh, I'm really taken back to those halcyon days of of April in 2010. If those of you can far uh, who are listening who are who can think back that far, and you see all these real really negative reviews, of the iPad has said, "Oh, I can't believe they built a netbook without a keyboard. It doesn't have even <laughs> one USB port, let alone three. Right, right. Like, okay, you're an idiot. They didn't decide. They tried. They didn't. Just, what Apple did was they they decided not to build a netbook, but to take all the things that people are attract that attract a netbook to that attract them to netbooks, small, large batteries a huge battery life, uh, inexpensive, does a certain core group of things extremely well, and they articulated it in the form of the iPad. I really think that the Kindle Fire is that exact same thing only applied to the iPad. We're not try They didn't try to make an iPad. They simply said, what is it that people really like about the iPad, and how can we make this into a product that makes sense for us, Amazon? And you start off with 199, not 200, right. 199. And every the only issue with giving kids, I think the Kindle of Fire is great. And by the way, I have the Nook uh, tablet now in my hands. And very sim it's very similar. I mean, it's yeah. practically identical. It's just whether you want to be with Amazon or Barnes & Noble. But I do have to say that one of the issues that people are going to have uh, with, boy, I'm sorry about that. That's, uh, I guess, it's at a different refresh rate than our cameras. <laughs> That's funny. We did not have that trouble. By the way, this that's, is... That's, that's HTML5. It's the underwater scene. <laughs> it feels uh, a little smoother, I have to say, than the, uh, it is. Than the Kindle Fire. Yeah, yeah it, it is. I, my, uh, uh, more memory, right? Uh, more, more, more storage, but then again, you need more storage on the Nook because you're not backed by uh, the cloud services of right, Amazon. Right. It's fifty dollars more expensive. Uh, they also they did something. Re I don't know whether this was technology or just really, really smart. They made sure that they partnered with magazine companies that were more interested in building real apps uh, for delivering the content right. as opposed to simply saying if you have a pdf of the new yorker here's an here's a wrapper for it that will allow people to manually scroll and zoom through this really grainy looking jpeg of uh, of your of your actual published page uh the people magazine app for instance for uh, if you buy a copy of people magazine uh, on the on the nook it really everything is completely formatted for the nook seven inch screen right so it's it's actually a non-painful experience the only uh, issue so i would have with giving uh an I uh, Kindle Fire to a kid is you're, you're it's like giving them your credit card. The, the, you have to yeah, kind of no. log it into an Amazon account, yep. and at that point you're screwed. I noticed that the uh, Nook, and I, I actually have to look for this on the. Uh, I'm so sorry about the strobing for those of you watching video. We'll have to figure out how we can sync. Oh, now it's really confusing. Awesome. It's, it's also out of focus. <laughs> uh, but I do notice that the Nook has a require password for purchases, and I think yep. that would be a nice feature to put in the uh, Kindle Fire. Right. The Fire yeah, is really one click all the way through. I asked them about that because I think that's it's, it's totally unlike uh, the iPad where they assume that kids are going to try to buy eight hundred dollars worth of movies and, right. and albums and they get their holds on it. They said that they're they're aware of it. They don't think it's they, they didn't want to get interfere with the consumer process. Sure, and they want to make it easier to buy. Problem, <laughs> right. Exactly. And it, well, a lot, well, a lot of the decisions that they made are really based on what is the least amount of effort required to do just about anything. Well, and the Amazon, uh, and so the Kindle Fire ships logged in. Too right, you buy yeah, it with your account. Right. It'll ship logged it's in. Ready to go. Like, oh, it's a security flaw, but I it's so great to just take it out of the box and it works. It's, there's there's a lot to be said. One difference on this Nook tablet, it it's it uh, unlike the Fire, it identifies itself as a mobile browser, which the Fire does not do. It says, "Oh no, I'm a big boy browser. I, I you can you can do anything you want with me." Yeah. This this is very similar <laughs> though. I, I don't find it that different. But I think they'll sell a lot. I think I think Amazon. The, I think the Fire is going to be a hit. I. I and, I think also, a lot of people now, I mean, but, it, but if you're the kid who has, you're the 44% of kids, 6 to 12, who said they wanted to have an iPad, and you get a Kindle Fire instead, you're not going to be happy. Are you? What was or it? are you? I, I, wish, I, I wish I could remember where it came from. There was a great joke like three weeks ago saying, uh, uh, 
So, so, so like a, a Samsung or somebody came up with like a really cheap knockoff iPad tablet that's actually being heavily promoted. And someone said that it's guaranteed to be the number one gift from well-meaning but not very clever aunts. <laughs> not, not very savvy, <laughs> yeah. Look, yes. I gave you a Nintendo. See, I got you one of them iPad things. It has <laughs> angry birds. Samsung. What's your problem? Yes. <laughs> uh, there is a new iPad 2 ad, the Love ad. Uh, I'll show you that in just a second. Uh, amid rumors that uh, we may get... Certainly, we're going to get an iPad 3 in the spring or summer of next year. Sure. It, it comes be, after 2. It comes after 2. It's the next. Uh, it may be, in fact, this is interesting, uh, LTE, like the iPhone 6 or whatever it is. <laughs> I'm sure, why not? No, you know, Andy, you made such a good point in your review of the iPhone 4S. I love the lead, by the way. Uh, and I don't want to misquote it. Read it. Just go to Chicago sometimes and read it. But the point you made is the only people who were disappointed with the iPhone 4S were the people who believed the lame-ass rumors about the iPhone 5 and said, well, if it's not an iPhone 5 with a bigger screen and 4G, I'm not going to buy it. Uh, so I don't want to get in that, in that game again because, of course, there are all these rumors about the next iPhone and the next iPad. I will show you, though, this is the iPad 2 Love Ad. We, in a great tradition of Mac Break Weekly, we like to show you the ads. Uh, even though For some, ads. it's a lifelong passion. For others, it's something discovered yesterday. Music, basketball. We all have things. Auto that design. Speak to us. <laughs> yeah, sure. We all do that. <laughs> they drive us to get up. And early. Andrew Wyeth apparently used an iPad. It's Christina's I'm world. I'm sure I can talk. <laughs> Getting lost in the things we love has never felt quite like this. Getting lost a, in the things we love. What a, what, a, what a great central message, though, uh, and, and a total 180 from how most of the Amazon, excuse me, most of the Android tablets are being promoted. It has LTE. It has right. a 10.1 inch LTE right. display. Apple is saying the device itself is irrelevant because yep. if you have it, it will integrate so tightly into your life, it will just be the way that you control your music devices. It will just be the way that you happen to draw. It'll yep. just be the way that if you need a sketch pad so that you can di diagram something for somebody, that's how you'll do it. It gets out of your what way. Nice it gets okay. out of your way. And uh, uh, it was M.G. Siegler, I think, who said, are we now in the post speeds and feeds world? Because, yeah. of course, they're promoting this as twice the speed, twice the RAM. People don't care. No. They don't even know what processor's in here or the iPad. No, Amazon has done a good job with the Kindle Fire ads of trying to appeal very, very much like Apple to the experience you have. And that I think that's really smart because in the end, if you play the speeds and feeds game, you're just going to end up racing to the bottom and it's, it becomes a commodity kind of thing. And, you know, the reason that Amazon and Barnes & Noble are investing in customizing Android and making it look like their own experiences because they don't want to be another an Android tablet. They want to be like, you can only get this from us, which is right. the same game that Apple plays. I think you're smart to say uh, it gets, we get basically you say we are immersed in the product and we do the things we love. The product is not the point. And that's really what Apple has said from day one. Right. You know, uh, I, when, they, when I first saw the iPad in January of uh, 2010, um, I, I thought immediately, this is, the, this is the products Apple was formed to create. Technology just finally yeah, caught it's up. It's the computer for the rest of us. It is, it is the computer for the rest of us. <laughs> yep. and, it's, and it gets out of the way. I, I, one, 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 of my, one of my favorite nostalgic little photos was a photo of my iPad on top of my little uh, Kingston stand with my Apple wireless keyboard in front of it with the picture of the original like Mac 128 hello screen on it yeah because I was just doing I was just in the coffee I was just in a pizza place doing some work and I realized that this really is the Mac that uh, Apple originally hoped to build after you know less than a thousand bucks ultra portable ultra personal uh it's such a big win we're going to take a break and come back we have uh, ios and uh mac os tips you're going to do an ios tip for I us i am thank you sir rock on we also have picks and more but before we do that i certainly would like to talk a little bit about audible.com and i bet you andy has an audible pick this is how i you know i'm uh, it's fun because we're, we're we're seeing the reviews now of the uh, isaacson book but i had to read it fast right i wanted to get i wanted to get through it as quickly as i could best way to do it naturally <laughs> audible.com 25 hour book i got through it in uh, less than a week because i listened when i was at the gym when i was in the car when i was walking the dog it, you know it brings reading back 
uh, into your life. And that's, I think, the best pitch of all for Audible.com. Audiobooks that play on your iPad, your iPod, your iPhone. Uh, of course, your Kindle Fire, if you happen to have one of those, or your Android <laughs> phone, even GPS device, pretty much anywhere you are, your computer as well. Um, and that means you can listen anytime, anywhere. I have When I get in my car, a book starts. I'm Right now, I'm listening to the new Neil Stevenson book, uh, Ream D, which I don't think Neil Stevenson actually wrote, but that's just my guess. It is such a non-Neil Stevenson book. I don't know. It's a Neil Stevenson book up to the point where it makes that left turn. Oh, I haven't for, gotten to the left turn yet. Oh, yeah. Well, wait right. for it. <laughs> then it. It makes a left turn and then goes for about 500 miles. Okay, good. <laughs> Maybe then I'm waiting for that because right now it's pretty prosaic. There's some bad writing in it, which I never experienced in my life from Neil Stevenson. Well, he's so big now that that he doesn't. I, I don't like think people assistant. touch his. I don't think people touch his writing. I, I oh, think he's not getting lots edited. Of authors is that uh, he get edited so much, and he writes so much that I mean, we've got to say it. Yeah. You probably can. He writes longhand too. But I liked it. Yo, I'm liking. It's not that I'm not liking it. It just doesn't seem like a Neil. For some reason, it just, <laughs> it's not. It's nothing like the Baroque cycle, Cryptonomicon. It's a little. Uh, it's a little snow crashy with the uh, the MMO. Of it. It's a little. It reminds me a little of Daniel Suarez's Demon as well. I mean, it has a little of that demon feeling. It's about a. It's about a, um, a game called T Rain. This is basically World of Warcrafty. Although I love the details about the creation yeah. of it. That's fascinating, and um, and something um, goes very wrong. I think we could say that without spoiling yeah. it. Uh, Reem D, that's also available for free right now to you. Yeah, this is the problem. You're going to pick one book out of 100,000. Uh, this is a good one, too. The Isaacson Books, too. Audible.com slash MacBreak. Go there. You'll sign up for the gold account. That's a book a month. Uh, I, you know, I think that's a good deal, a very good deal. And uh, uh, I think the first month is free. The first book is free, and you can cancel at any time, but you get to keep the book forever. So that's a good deal. Uh, we've got two that we recommended. Oh, Ready Player One is supposed to be very good as well. Yeah, I hear good it, things about in, that. No? It, it, it sort of, it, hey, if you're from the 80s, it's awesome because it makes, right. it's totally awesome, in fact. <laughs> right. Because it makes lots of 80s references. I'm not, But it though. is sort of like Snow Crash Light. I lived through the 80s, but I don't want to go back there. So, okay, I'm going to pass on that one. But some might like it. Will it's Wheaton very reads it. It's a very geeky book. It is. It is a lot of fun. And Will yeah. Wheaton. Will Wheaton reading it would be a lot of fun. Yeah, awesome. But it's you know, it, if you read Snow Crash, you sort of read it. How about you, Andy? <laughs> what you reading these days? Uh, right now, I am uh, uh, reading uh, The Virgin in the Ice, which is one of the earlier Brother Catfell mysteries. I uh, love Brother, Cat Brother Catfell. I love him. Yeah, it's just such a great. It, it's one of those concepts that is explained to you, and you you, you got to figure it's worth six or seven bucks to buy a paperback just to see how this concept works its way out. Uh, where the, the 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 basic concept is that it's the 1100s uh, in uh, Shrewsbury in uh, in England, uh, and there is a up and coming <laughs> up up and coming monastery where uh, the uh, healer and herbalist is uh, Brother Cadfile, who. Unlike most of the other monks who basically were raised by monks and basically entered the entered holy orders like at age like minus eight, he <laughs> basically he, he he became a monk at age forty ten years earlier after a lifetime as a sailor and fighting in the Crusades. So he has a certain worldliness and understanding of the outside world that the other monks don't have. And so when bad things happen in town, he's usually the one who will be the first to realize that maybe it wasn't an act of God that caused this guy mm. to be hanged. Perhaps it was. Actually, somebody who killed him. Perhaps mm. I should look into this. Uh, and this so it's is basically one of, one of, Sherlock Holmes is a monk in 1139. It's a, it's a, actually it's probably closer to Columbo. Columbo, uh, okay. <laughs> because he, he is he is he is kind of the outsider of right. the monastery because he's again he's he's like he's he's like he's like the the, the, the tonsure come lately uh, of the group. So you, he's not really a monk. He just came late to the order. Oh goodness, what does he know? But nonetheless, like the abbot knows that. You know what? This is kind of a sensitive diplomatic thing where if if the, if where if the if the the Empress Maud's courier got killed as as opposed to it went an accident, basically this entire land where we have our church will become an active battlefield. Uh, Cadfile, why don't you go over there with the rest of the delegation who's burying the body? And just sort of look around. Uh, so it's well well written, well paced. Uh, and it's it's just such a it's it's of the time of the time that it's placed in, but it's not just it's it's not the he did the the the, uh, the author didn't make the mistake of writing a 20, 20th century character who lives in the eleven hundreds. He really does have the perception of someone you imagine would live uh, in those times. Let, so let, just the, just the disconnection is great. Let me ask you this: Should you start? I mean, there's a bunch of these. Should you start at the first one, or does it matter? 
the first one is uh, A Morbid Taste for Bones, which is also a great book. I think I recommended right. it, matter of fact, like three years ago. Oh, okay. Um, the... Sometimes it's not the uh, sometimes it's not the first book in a series you want to try out. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm, on my other podcast, I was talking about uh, science fiction books that I had never really enjoyed reading, and someone was telling me, "Well, you know, Ring World is a great series, but you don't want to start with the first one. You actually want to start with number eight or number oh, nine. That's interesting. When he had when when Terry Pratchett had actually really figured out the right. world that he was building and what he was doing, and actually, you can get, if you're, you'll be confused maybe for the first chapter, but then it's 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 a it's a better ride for the rest of the book. Uh, I like this one because there's less there's less setup also it's a much I, I won't spoil anything for you uh, the basic concept is that there is a body that a, a girl's body is found embedded in the ice and the identity of this woman and how she came to find that end is essentially the thrust of, of most of the story now uh, I gotta warn you there are three different versions on audible this yeah. is audible's gotten so big uh, now that they have multiple uh, copies of the same book, the one I would get is the uh, one narrated by Patrick Patrick Tull. Tull. Yeah. He is one of my. F Let me play a little bit of Patrick Tull. He is such a good narrator. I just love him. The homeless dog she saw on the streets, if she could. This poor girl from Worcester will do well enough now. There's nothing amiss with her. The rest won't mend. We may yet have two births he's, here for this he's Christmas. He's a brilliant actor and he really well brings the books to life. I became aware of him first when I was reading the Aubrey Maturin series. Now I think I have to do the whole Brother Catfell series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get the Patrick Tull version, absolutely, if you're going to get it. And, and you can get it for free right now. Go to audible.com slash MacBreak. Your first book is free. And, uh, and I think you're going to uh, become an Audible listener. I know we all are. Audible.com slash MacBreak. Time for our let's do the uh, let's do the um, let's do Jason's tip first. Oh, right. Well, you, we, you, I can do it. Okay, I can do it. Jason Snell Let me with a it to you. with a tip for us <laughs> for iOS users. Um, this is something that I actually uh, wrote about. I did a video of last week on Mackerel.com. Um, you know, when you've got your iPhone, it'll chime. You can set it to chime when you get an email. Yes. Um, Which drives me crazy, by the way. But my, mine so is randomly email. buzzing. I don't well, want it to buzz anymore. And I get so much email that it doesn't really matter, right? right? Uh, it doesn't help in any way. So right. what, I, what I use is an app called Boxcar. Uh, which is, I, I think it's free, and then you can pay to turn the ads off on it for five bucks. Yep. And what you do is you, you, you need an email client or an email account that has a server, server side rule. So Gmail will do this. You basically go to Gmail, um, or you download Boxcar, and you add a new email rule. And what happens is it gives you like an email address that you have to send a message to. And any message sent to this Boxcar email address will fire off a push notification to your iPhone. Ah. So what you what you have so to, you make a rule that will say right. notify Boxcar, and it's not quite so easy to do it in Gmail as as my video shows that that we're that we're looking at here. Right. You've got to verify. So the first thing you do is you put it in Gmail, and it says I'm going to send an email address with right. a secret code. Uh, when you do that, though, that triggers off a push notification. You get the secret code on your phone. Uh -huh. So then you enter that back in Gmail, and once you've done that, then your Gmail account any filter can fire off a forwarded message to your Boxcar email address. Once you've done that, and you can watch my video for the details, but basically it lets you say, you know, if I get an email from my wife, or if I get an email from my mother, or this is one I actually have, if I get an email from somebody in Apple PR, right. <laughs> um, fire that off and make an alert sound on my phone so I know that I immediately, that I got an email from that person. So it's, you know, it's, it's a little selective. more discriminating. Yes. Right, because I don't need to know every message that I get, but I do need to know from three, four, five important people or it could be important subjects or priorities or however you want to do it but if you use your gmail or some other server-based rule to to forward those messages to boxcar boxcar will then send you a push notification have to you your ever iPhone. tried if this then that i i tried it when i when i first saw about it but this I is a, it this you could i think use the same way well not well not exactly the same way it'd be different uh, it's free. Wire it up. Ifttt.com, and what you would do is you'd say, "Send me a text message when I get a message from Apple PR." Right, and then it would do it would do a text. It would do and a Boxcar text. Boxcar uses the Apple uh, push just because a push system. notification. So this would be another way to do something different, but but similar right, idea. Right. And the yeah. other thing, I, I also use Boxcar because it it um, it'll alert me for various other things, um, including it's got growl support. So if you've got events happening on your Mac that you want to push to your right. iPhone, it'll right. do that. Which is that th those are the moments where I stop and am kind of amazed. About modern technology, it's, it's pretty like cool. everything talks to everything. Safari finished, yeah, and yeah. 
my phone tells me it's the done, says, and it's I can done. go back to the Mac. File's done. <laughs> so Boxcar, it's it's uh, it's useful, and and certainly if you want, ever wanted email from specific people to fire off a push notification, it can be done. Boxcar is really great. I actually use it yeah. too. I love it. Um, and it would be cool if we could get the. Uh, the file's done from AOL, and you could have their phone say that to you. I wish you could use custom sounds <laughs> on it. Boxcar's got some sounds, <laughs> but you don't own. have access to yeah. the, like all the all the custom. Sounds. File's done. Uh, <laughs> only AOL people are. You've laughing got mail. In that one. You've got mail. <laughs> Dur what's his name? Durwood. Actually, all the old um, uh, Warcraft players will will remember. Uh, jobs, jobs done. done. <laughs> Stop touching me! <laughs> Stop it! All right. I hope that wasn't too cheesy, but that's my tip. <laughs> no, that's a great tip. Boxcar is a wonderful app. Now it's time for Andy Anako's Lion tip. Yeah. It is actually an iTunes match tip more than anything else. You know, we need uh, more of those, actually. I'm glad to have mm. that. Yeah. I was I was concerned that iTunes... Uh, I'm not locked into iTunes at all. I've, um, I rarely buy any music through the iTunes store. And my concern was that they would add some cool features that would be so compelling that, oh, dang it, now I really do have to buy all my stuff through iTunes as opposed... To, I usually buy stuff through Amazon MP3. But I was pleased to say that no matter how... The music that you buy lands inside your iTunes library. iTunes Match will automatically match it and add it to your iCloud. So if you are using uh, Google Music as your music locker, or if you're buying music through Amazon MP3 and you're using their automatic downloader, it doesn't matter. What will happen is that you'll make your album purchase or your track purchase through Amazon MP3. The downloader will automatically add it to your iTunes library. A magical event happens, and it, and iTunes simply will push the, push the track information. It will be matched by iTunes Match. And now the album that you bought from Amazon MP3 will be available to you uh, from the iTunes store through any device that you have that works with iTunes Match. Uh, and I think that's just wonderful uh, <laughs> because... I do, I, I do prefer Amazon MP3 because it's the most ecumenical. The, the fact that I was buying all my music through Amazon was part of, I think, what, why I had such a great experience with, uh, with the Kindle Fire. You Just like Jason says, it's pre-registered for you. You take it out of the box, you turn it on, and it says, oh, by the way, here are 89 albums. Would you like to play any of them? Or none of them, or all of them, by all means. Don't I don't don't don't, don't dock anything. Don't select anything. I'll just play it for you automatically. I thought so. Given that right now there's there are multiple music stores that will each really sell you the exact same copy of the exact same digital file. Uh, I'm still using Amazon MP3, and the fact that now iTunes Match will give me direct no sync streaming to my iPhone and my iPad just means that this is why I'm spending 25 bucks a year for iTunes Match and also why I can still have the freedom to choose whatever music store that I want. Why do they charge it? Somebody asked this in the chat room earlier and I'd like to know if you guys know. Why do they charge a yearly fee? Don't you just convert all your music and you're done? Well, so, It's good for next year, right? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I wrote this. I mean, the, the, you keep the files forever. Right, but, so we're done. But um, since I've started using it, that was my initial reaction when it got announced and since I've started using it, I, I was like, oh, I see. Because it's the syncing stuff stuff that lets makes you keep paying $25 a year. If all you want to do is upgrade your files, yeah, you can do it once. But the syncing stuff is I'm sitting in that airport and I want to play or I'm on my iPhone. Oh, so and you I want to it's tap. not that's not an iCloud feature. That's a That's an I, that's iTunes, iTunes match, match feature. feature. Got all, it. The, all the music syncing is an iTunes. So that little match puffy feature. cloud showing up in my iTunes. That's iTunes match. I have to pay 25 bucks. Right, for right. That. So if you want the syncing and if you, you know 25 bucks a year, it's I worth was, it. I was skeptical and now I'm thinking, yeah, worth they it. got me again. Especially if you yeah. got you spent money on an air and you don't have all that room for the music. I'm going to add one more tip because there are some t cuts that do not get converted. There, there. You'll see in your iTunes an ineligible cloud, a cloud with a line through right. it, and that happens if you've got a VBR recording. And unfortunately, most of my well, ripped no, stuff is no, VBR. No, I, I've got lots of VBR, and it's it, fine. It low, it, low bit rate is a problem. Ninety-six kilobits or less, it won't right. take. All you have to do is convert it to AAC That's at a higher tip. bit rate. Yep, and then it'll upload, and then it'll match, and then you delete it. Then you delete the last. You download it. Yep. And you got it back. So Michael yeah. Rose wrote this in the uh, unofficial Apple web blog. He has an article on it, how to get it to recognize tracks that it just don't like. <laughs> Apparently, he's got some MP2 files. Yeah. That's not going to work. <laughs> hey, he look, says, it's a link to Macworld's thorough rundown. I love that. Yeah, that's because you guys that's, figured that's, it out yeah, first. That was me. We should, we should point it out. <laughs> so so I shouldn't is, give him any credit. But no, he had, his detail is fantastic about going through and, and uh, re-ripping the files right. and then uploading them and then deleting them and downloading them, and it totally works. Yeah, I, I did it. 
And by the way, I do recommend the Macworld uh, thorough uh, explanation of uh, both iCloud and Match because it's not clear what's going on. You need, yeah. you need this. And Apple doesn't Apple publish has instructions. Done, Apple has really done a uh, iTunes Match is a really interesting product, and Apple has done a terrible job yeah. of explaining it. Yeah. I'm, so uh, that, as into the breach step us. Yeah. Right? So yeah. that's good. Absolutely. No, that's a, I, my, my upcoming uh, Macworld or Macworld uh, our column is about this, but I, it's it's rare to see Apple fumble so consistently over the past couple of months and just the simple act of education where all they needed is, you know, they, they got them guys in the black t-shirts. They got one of them white backgrounds. They could simply roll down behind them, have them make videos and explain how things work. They, 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 they That benefits the users greatly. And when guys like us are like on day one thinking, Oh, is it streaming or is it downloading? I don't. It looks like it's downloading, but it could be streaming. What? How does this? Work? Oh, how come my my smart playlist is? It's there, but this other one isn't there. But the tracks are in now not in the right order. And why does it think that the e, all the e online podcasts use the B fifty twos album art logo for? Oh, I'm not very <laughs> smart today, am I? So um, this is this the tutorial how to upgrade to tracks to iTunes Match fast. Well, so that one you make a it shows you how to make a smart playlist. This is Jason which, has a bunch which, of these which guides identifies here. all your low bit rate tracks right. that are matched. So they're not they're uh, ones that that you know have been matched in the cloud. But not but they still right. want to you still want to delete them. So you make the smart playlist and then you, what you do is you hold down I think it's the option key and hit mm. delete, which forces all the tracks in the playlist to be deleted from your library and then and then you select them all and choose download and they all come back down, which will take a while because it could be thousands of tracks and you you might want to, you know, you read the article, you might want to do it in stages, right. but um, it really works. You just find your low bitrate stuff, delete them, re-download them, at, but only after they've matched. Otherwise, you'll lose your track. Smart Don't playlist is a clever way to do this. But, yeah. but again, yeah. you know, to Andy's point, it is kind of amazing that Apple has come out with a product. This is an online service that Apple sort of did right. Some aspects of this technology are really cool. Right. And yet they're... They didn't they, document they it. They don't explain yeah. it at all yeah. to anybody. It's, yeah. it's, I mean, which again, it's great for those of us who are in for the Mac business world. of explaining things. <laughs> yeah. But right. the fact it's, that it's they're not, not out there beating the drum about it baffles me. Right. right. And the thing is, it's not that it's a complicated thing. It's just that you have to understand maybe four basic concepts that will inform every further understanding that you have. So one, again, one moderately attractive guy in a fitted t-shirt against a white background could have solved a lot of problems for a lot of people. So, you know, we were talking a little bit about it on, um, because we were talking about Google Music on Twit this week with Kara Swisher and, and Kevin Rose and Mike Elgin. Uh, and all, all of them agreed that this is moot because we just use Spotify. And who cares? Mm -hmm. We no longer need cuts. Steve Jobs was wrong. People don't have to own it. We're perfectly happy to pay 10 bucks a month, which is a lot yeah. more than Match, and just use Spotify. No? Not, not, not for me. Not you. Because I, I, the, I can't predict what I'm going to be using this album for uh, in, in a month from now, six months from now, a year from now. The fact that I was able to turn on that Kindle Fire and instantly have my entire library available to me without having to do anything demonstrates why I was, or at least for me and the way that I play music, I was smart to have, uh, have, my, have my music that way without having to download Spotify, without having to wait for Spotify to become available for Apple TV or for the Boxy Box or whatever. I'm sorry, Spotify, I think, is already available for Boxy. But that's the sort of questions I don't really have to answer if I have actual files that I can then put wherever I want. So. Yeah, it's, I mean, a style. It's, a, it's a personal decision how you use music. For me, it's always like uh, paying rent versus um, paying for a mortgage. Is that right. you know, if I if I spend five years on Spotify and at the end I decide to stop paying, right. all the music that I've discovered in the last five years is gone. I think it speaks to the commoditization of music, alas, in uh, in our day and oh. age, and that generations now hey if it disappears big deal there's another album and it's it's well that's i, I think maybe that's always been true for some people and how right. they listen to music and i think for other people they'll they'll like both i actually think the perfect system and then this is why i'm surprised apple hasn't done a subscription service is for some people i think the perfect system is you buy the stuff you really love yeah. and want to hold on to forever yeah. but you also mm -hmm. have one of these ten dollar a month subscription services to discover new music and right. I, you right. know pandora which uh, you know i is not even ten dollars a month for the free version you just you know you just press play I, I can't tell you how much music I bought because of Pandora. It's actually dangerous. So I use Pandora to discover, right. and I use Spotify or Rhapsody to s discover, and then the stuff I really like, I buy, and then I know that I've just got that forever. Right. And maybe you know a younger person wouldn't feel that way, but that's the great thing. You, it, I don't think it's an either or. You can choose. Right. Yeah, I use both. I do use both, and I've been doing music, iTunes Match, 
like crazy trying to get all those cuts. And by the way, somebody asked in the chat room, well, what happens after the year on iTunes Match? Yeah, you, you keep that you song. Keep it's yours forever. forever. There's no DRM. No DRM, which is nice because I'm, one thing about iTunes Match that's funny is you can only use it on five computers. <laughs> right. <laughs> but once you've done it, those songs now are capable, compatible with every other right, computer. Right, right. So. And that's the streaming. That has to do with right. the streaming that's more the than streaming the files. Thing, yeah. But it is sort of like Amnesty for everybody who downloaded it's things on beautiful, Napster. Beautiful yeah. thing. And I'm converting all those 96 kilobit VBRs. Well, I was going to have to re-rip all my CDs, and now right. I don't have to. So it's you did great. it too? Yeah. You did a VBRs or you did yeah, well, low I did, quality? Yeah, I did like 128s and then I went back and I did more at VBR, but they're still like 180 VBR. So right. even then, the, the 256 okay. AACs that are on Apple server better. are better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, it, it, made, it forced me to like dig out the huge hard drive that I had, like the backup of my master music library on. Because right. for the past year or two, I've actually just been like listening to a subset, uh, a subset that's just like the stuff I bought digitally, and just the stuff that was maybe the gigabyte or two or three of album selections that were good enough to put like on a notebook at some point. This is not like my entire like original like thousand CD collection. And man, did it feel good when I dug out that hard drive, like added it to a brand new iTunes library that had never existed before on my desktop machine just for the purpose of introducing it to iTunes Match and now having, oh, it turns it turns out that Elvis, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, the Elvis Costello's Spike album has more than three tracks on it. I forgot <laughs> about that. Interesting. <laughs> Return to Spikes. So. Yeah, and you don't have to, I mean, I, 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 you should keep a version of your library, I think, around and not just trust in Apple, but I used right. to have a yep. backup of it. And I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to have right. one local copy and then trust that Apple can be my backup. I've got hard, hard drives all over the place. With Full of music. MP3s. God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all over the place. All right. We're going to uh, quickly uh, run through our picks of the week uh, and wrap this thing up. Let's start with uh, you, Andy Yanako. Your pick of the week, sir. My pick of the week is a really cool journaling app called Day One. Uh, and I think it's, you can find it at uh, dayoneapp.com, is That's it? That's correct. O-N-E. Exactly. Yes, yeah, spelled out. O-O-N-E. Uh, oftentimes you'll get like the idea of, oh, I should keep a journal, not just for my deepest, innermost thoughts and dreams, if I track them every day, but also just the idea of, hey, I just had a baby. I really want to like not, not lose all this information about you know what's happened with this, my kid's life day after day after day. And sometimes it's actually just a writing project where you just want to write something every single day. This is a really nice it's almost like it's a word processor that is designed around the idea of writing something every day or writing something according to a calendar because the central user interface is indeed what looks like a, a, a hipper version of iCal. It's just a calendar that simply quietly tells you, oh, you've written something for this day, you haven't written something for that day, uh, and uh, you can write pretty much good, rich text, long form. Uh, an upcoming version, according to the site, will also include uh, media uh, so you can add that to the mix. Uh, so you can also have it remind you that you haven't added, any, added something to your journal today. So please, maybe you want to pay attention to that. Not only that, but there's also iOS apps for it that will integrate very nicely together. So while you're traveling, if you just have your iPhone, you haven't done anything today, and maybe you're not going to sit down and write a thousand words about meeting George Lucas and him being so impressed with what you thought the flaws of Phantom Menace were. But actually just, at least I can put in three sentences of, oh, well, I was, uh, I, I, I kind of like was a little bit under the weather today. So instead of taking out the recycling, I just went to the coffee shop and read for two hours. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a cool inspirational app because uh, every time I, one, of the, one of my favorite books that gets transferred in digital and audio formats to every device that I own are Michael Palin's uh, diaries. Mm, yes. uh, that, that two volumes that cover from 1970 all the way to the end of the 80s where he's just a, an incredible every single day he sits down and writes a diary entry and these are edited versions of it. And you really do think about all of the information that gets lost that of course maybe you're going to you're going to remember the day when your parents died you're going to remember the day that your kid was born but maybe you'll lose so much information about the texture of that day and maybe the days that became that came before it and after it are also just as significant so i would really enjoy it if i this app helped me to get into that habit of even if it's just two sentences that's that said well i finished i started off my kindle my uh, my uh, my review yesterday finally finished it today but then i had a uh, i did the podcast it was great i got to talk to jason uh who i don't get to talk to as often as i would like leo was on good form and then i went out to dinner afterward just that thing you never know like two years from now or 20 years from now how interesting that will be so i think it's a i think it's an interesting app to play with it's 10 bucks from the app store uh but that's not a whole lot of money for a really well polished app 
I, it's, I keep thinking I want to do a journal. I know I don't want to lose these things. Uh, yeah. and, and I've downloaded a number of apps for that. Uh, this looks like the best, though. I'm, I'm proud. I'll have to download it, it. It's a very, very pretty app, yeah. too. It's like uh, I, I'm, I'm so impressed with developers who not only have a good idea, but they execute in such a way that reminds me why I own a Mac instead right. of any other operating system. Right. And this is a very, very Mac-like app. But no stitched leather, so I don't know. I, I mean, I'll be <laughs> You'll have to, to get this. used to that. I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure that if you if you add that to the bug fix report, they'll they'll add that as, as a trackable item. <laughs> Skeuomorphic interface, please. Uh, <laughs> Good pick. Day one. Day one app dot com for iOS as well as desktop. And now, Jason Snell, your pick of the week, sir. It's amazing. Andy and I didn't plan you're, this. You're both writers. That's I, why. Yeah, we were writers. And it is National Novel Writing Month, as, as previously mentioned. Rimo. 1,667 words a day. You've done this before. Guys. I've done this. This is my sixth year. I'm at about 32,000 words now. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I'm hoping to have it. This time, I'm hoping to actually publish it when I'm done. What's the goal? 10,000 words in a 50, month? 50,000. 50. 50. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm hoping that when I'm all, all said and done, I'll put something out there on Amazon and iBooks. Uh, the premise being that uh, even if what you're writing is junk, the only way to get good at writing is writing every day. Right, you need to write every day. You, you really shake the rust off. That's um, setting a goal for yourself, like running a marathon or climbing a mountain, right. is something that you should do. And it, writing is hard, and so setting goals can help you do it. And I never, I always thought, well, someday maybe I'll write a novel, and I never, ever did it. And then six years ago, I, I did NaNoWriMo, and 50 thousand words later I had the start of a novel and it ended up being like 120,000 words before I was done. My but. problem is always I sit down and I just I go I everything I, I can't write. I don't have anything to say. I need I need a little Well, it's a, it's a challenge. So so one prod is a uh, part of my pick of the week which is this website and Mac app and iPhone app called Write or Die. In fact, <laughs> in fact they call it putting the prod in productivity. Exactly. The idea here is that you can set a, a difficulty level and you set a goal for yourself yeah. and then it begins to make you angry and threaten you <laughs> if you don't write. If you switch away, oh, it'll start great. flashing, it'll make for, annoying for... signs and in the ultimate evil mode, it will begin deleting what you've already written oh, no. if you don't keep writing. <laughs> oh so, my God. Literally, go, write or die. Yeah, well, as quite prods literally. go... Uh, wow. I, I think I love the idea to try to keep you keep you going, keep you writing, because getting those two thousand words in NaNoWriMo, boy, it's hard. Yeah. And the, the internet is such an easy distraction. I think one of my previous picks on this show was something called Freedom, which just turns off your internet so that you can write instead right. of looking at the internet. Um, anyway, so that's a great pick. And then just more generally, um, and I know I'm Andy's sure Andy's talked fan. about it, yeah, Scrivener, yeah. which yeah. is what I used to write all my long form. Now stuff. Lion compatible, we like. That. Yeah, it works great. Um, uh, Andy uses it for a lot of stuff. I use it for all my long form stuff. It is if if there is only one um, long form writing creative writing tool you can use, I think it's Scrivener. So it, it doesn't sync to the iPad, and it, you know that's one of these sources of frustration. But um, I've been toting my MacBook Air around all month and using Scrivener to write my novel, and it's got an outliner and notes. It's got all these kind of integrated organizational tools plus a good writing environment all together so instead of like switching between an outlining app and a writing app and you know a, a brainstorming app it all happens in in Scrivener and it's 45 bucks and it's well worth it I, I love it it is one of the it's, finds of the last 10 years really not, not only that it, it really is fine-tuned into the process of taking this enormous project that you cannot possibly get your head around I mean Leo, Leo you're absolutely right it's like I want to tell I want to write a novel but how do you write 130,000 words well you don't you start off with one index card with one idea for one scene that just came into your head and then after about a week or two you have kind of like an outline and then you start saying well I'm not, I really don't have it in me to write a 120,000 word novel so I'm just going to put into a document the way that I would describe this story if I was describing it to some to somebody. Okay, well, you start. It starts off at this lighthouse off of Cape Cod. It's kind of a rundown lighthouse. It's so rundown. This can be closed down. There's only one person who works there anymore because there are no ships that, that actually come into town. He just really sort of rents that. But then he actually finds this box. It's, you realize that's not a chapter, but you are actually getting yourself through the story. Scrivener will, without imposing any structure of its own, will help you to every whatever you can do for this piece of work, whether it's a nonfiction book or fiction book. 
it will help you get to that next step of it. And then you, you one day you just sort of look at all the stuff you have and you realize that, wow, it would only take me about a month to turn all this stuff, all these notes, all these photos that I've added to this for reference, all these maps from 1911 Boston that I've acquired because I, was, I did some research uh, at the library into an actual publishable thing. I should do that now. So... It it really it really is. I, I I cannot get if there. I I I often thought that I should have like just to have a list of the five things that I think are the greatest things ever uh, in the in the Mac App Store, and mm -hmm. it would start off with okay, obviously Scrivener, uh, four and then four more things. You know, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's my memory that Scrivener was written by a writer yes. who yeah. taught himself to program so that he because he couldn't find the right tool, so he wrote it. And that's why it's good, is that yeah. he built the tool that he as felt like he needed first. as a writer. Yeah. Not, yeah. Not, yeah, and you can tell. There are a bunch of, and every time I, rec I recommend this app so publicly, there will always be a few people who, quite correctly, will point out that there are a bunch of open source and other apps that are kind of like Scrivener, but nothing executes this concept as well as Scrivener does. The Keltex we've talked about and some other... Yeah. Uh, similar things. Uh, quickly, I, I, we were almost out of time, so I'm just going to do a quick uh, point out, not as much a recommendation. I, I know Andy doesn't use Quicksilver. Um, I, do you use Quicksilver? I use Launch Bar. Launch Bar. Okay. I'm a Quicksilver fanatic. Unfortunately, uh, the guy wrote Quicksilver, got a job with Google, and he pretty much abandoned it. Yep. Uh, the good news is it has been uh, open sourced <laughs> and recovered. Debandoned. Debandoned. <laughs> and uh, it, for a while, it wasn't working with Lion. Now it does. And so don't go to Black Tree, which is... Uh, Alcor's website because he doesn't have the latest version. The latest version is at qsapp.com. It is still free. Uh, I think, it, and this is a Merlin man, loves this. It's a very, very capable free version of what Launch Bar, uh, Arthur, and other apps do. Or Alfred. Right? Alfred, not, I always get the A, a right. word wrong. Right, it's the A words. But no, I, I like if, Alfred a lot. You, I use Alfred, but I went back to Quicksilver once it worked with Lion. And if you're a Mac user who's skeptical, it's like, oh, keyboards, you know, that's what's great about the Mac is that you don't have to use keyboards and all that, you, you, you know, old keyboard command line stuff. Trust me. There is nothing more productive, nothing that's a bigger productivity boost than any of these apps. Because the idea that you can go tap tap and you're in an app instead of like I'll go to the Digging Finder the and finder. I'll find an, yeah. uh, you know in the Applications folder and I'll go in there, it, you know it, it's, it's such a productivity boost. It would yeah. be on my list actually. One of these tools would be a must. Scrivener, this we're building a list now. Right, Andy. we are. <laughs> and you know I, I know Don McAllister is also a massive Launch Bar fanatic. Uh, people who but what happens is you get used to one way of doing it and you yeah. and you customize the hell out of it and that's the one you're going to use. Andy doesn't like putting these things on his systems because he says, but then what happens if I use somebody else's system and it doesn't have it? I've gotten dependent on it. Yeah. I don't mind. I'm dependent on Quicksilver, and uh, and I think this is a great one. It is free. It's free. QSapp.com is the place to go now to get the uh, latest updates. Uh, Alcor has passed on the uh, torch. The BIC? The BIC, so to speak. <laughs> hey, thank you so much, Jason Snell, for making your way up the, up the peninsula a little bit and uh, joining us. Uh, Good to be here. Always glad to have you. Nice, Mac uh, World. nice place you got here. Pretty sweet. Pretty sweet. I'm pretty proud of what we did. I mean, it's no Dan Benjamin, but uh, I'm working on it. Uh, I'm, I just realized both closet. of you do shows for Dan. Yeah. Well, I, didn't, I, I forgot about that. Um, uh, Alex, I'm sorry, um, uh, Mac, Jason Snell. Yes. Jason Present. Snell. Thank you. Does a show called the Incomparable. Yes. I like, I like the name, The Incomparable. Uh, you're talking about Darth Vader's office, apparently. Yeah, that's my son's <laughs> line when watching Empire Strikes Back was, Darth Vader's office is really weird. Ooh, it's weird. that, like, clamshell thing. That comes <laughs> really in. weird. It's like, like sci-fi and uh, books and movies and TV and geeky uh, kind of and, cultural and, geek stuff. And, and if you, great, and great cast. Not only is Jason on all the time, but he's got all the uh, best people like John and Glenn Fleischman and Serenity Caldwell, Scott McNulty joining him. So a great uh, show to listen to. Occasionally Andy and Otko. And maybe Andy. I was, I was on once. I would like to be on again. Maybe yes. Andy will be Come on back. every once in a while. And Andy has a new... I see now Alex Lindsay has a show there, too. What are this guy's... You, this guy... <laughs> the, Jesus. We got, we, we got a slot for you, too, Leo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. maybe I should just kill the twit and go to 5 by 5 uh, now, is that, is that, now, is that twit logo on the back of the wall? Is that, like, <laughs> nailed in? Or can we, can we hang, like, a, 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 a 5 by 5 logo on top of we it? We just or? put a 5 by 5 the Inatco we'll Almanac, which is a great name for any show that Andy Inatco is involved with. Andy and Dan do this one. Uh, fortunately, they haven't started doing video yet, but it's just a matter of time. Well, I think Dan's studio is like a closet in Austin, Texas. So Let's you may, you may have the video <laughs> upper hand there for a Thank while. God! <laughs> Nobody wants to see...
my podcast theater. <laughs> no. But they're well worth listening to, 5 by 5 Somebody wrote me an email saying, why do you keep plugging 5 by 5 You're trying to get out of, put yourself out of business? No, because it's uh, we're all collegial. Because because we're all here to unite against the common em enemy, <laughs> whom we whose name we will not mention because that would be promotion of the enemy. Exactly. The internet is big enough for all of us. Let's and, hope so. And, uh, it's no, it isn't. Not for the two of us and this other character. 5 by 5 Let's not kid ourselves. Yeah, he who shall not be named. Uh, <laughs> hey, thank you both for being here. Andy Naco also writes for the Chicago Sun-Times, MacWorld.com for Jason Snell. Great pleasure. Great cast. Thank you for being here, and we'll see you uh, next time. Thank you for joining us. We do Mac Break Weekly every week at uh, around 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1900 UTC on Tuesdays. But you can always watch or listen after the fact. We make audio and video versions available at twit.tv. And while you're at twit.tv, don't forget to go to the Best Of page, twit.tv slash best of, because we are looking to collect great moments from this year's Mac Break Weekly for our holiday episode. We like to give the cast a week off after Christmas, between Christmas and New Year's, and that Tuesday we'll have a uh, best of episode for you. So help us make it if you would. If you've got memories of a great moment, just to go to twit.tv slash best of. Give us as much information as you can and we'll turn that into a podcast by hook or by crook. Uh, thank you all for being here. Now you better get back to work because break time is over. <laughs>